What was good to be at camp this last week with our high school students. Surprisingly, I did not break a hip when I was in the mosh pit with them uh, during that time. It was, it's uh, so amazing and so much fun to be back at Thousand Pines and to be at a high school camp. And, you know, they haven't been to camp since, uh, do a camp like that since 2019. It's been a lot, a lot of pent up. You can see it. It's still kind of spilling over. And uh, thank you for praying. And what a, what a, what an amazing summer we have had here at Beach Point. Um, we are looking at this series uh, called Ascend. We're looking at these psalms uh, where they're called the Psalms of Ascent. And uh, the, the psalm today focuses on how God is our help. And if we're honest, many of us in this room ha- would say we don't like asking for help. Like we... We believe that God is our help, and we believe, uh, like, we will, we will be empathetic. We like to help other people. We think helping is good. But when you're in a, in a vulnerable position, when you're in a difficult situation, the idea of asking for help makes you perhaps feel weak, uh, help makes you feel in some ways uh, embarrassed, and, and there's a way in which we kind of, instead of seeking help, we try to find another gear. We try to drive through it. it it's interesting. My, uh, my mom tells me that uh, listening to my sermon, she learns a lot about my childhood and our family. She's like, I did not know that story. And it's like, oh, really? And I didn't really appreciate it until um, my son is, uh, is a pastor. He's the, the Justin of another church up in uh, C- uh, House Verdes, and uh, he, was t- he was preaching, and I was listening to the story. I'm like, I do not remember this happening. I felt very irresponsible as a parent, but we had gone on this, this uh, trip down to San Diego, and we were, uh, he was out, it was like this beach camping trip, and he's out surfing, and I think he's like a young middle schooler. He's out surfing, he's out, out uh, past the break, and he sees a lifeguard kind of waving in his direction. And he's kind of like, who's he waving at? And he's trying to figure out who, who the lifeguard is trying to get the attention of. And he doesn't really see anyone. And then he notices the lifeguard swimming out towards him. And he's thinking, someone's in trouble. And he's trying to figure out who's in trouble out here. I don't, I don't notice anyone. Like he's thinking maybe someone is under the water or something. He can't figure it out. And then he notices like the lifeguard swimming fast and has like the, the red buoy behind. And then he realizes, Oh no, he's coming for me. And he's like trying to paddle away from the lifeguard because he, he's embarrassed that he's going to have to get help from a lifeguard and be towed in back into shore. And so finally the lifeguard gets him and explains to him, you're, in, you're caught in a pretty significant riptide right now. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help pull you out of this and we'll get you into a safety. And so look, no one wants to do the paddle of shame, right? You don't want to have that sense of that. But, but no lifeguard wants to lose a swimmer to a riptide. And so that sense of asking for help sometimes for us is very difficult. Uh, we can see this also enter into our life with God, that while we, we worship God, we believe huge things about who God is, that when we find ourselves in trouble, there's a, there, there can be a sense of independence, That somehow I have to fight through this myself. Somehow I have to pull myself up by my own bootstraps kind of mentality. And we we push and we exhaust all our resources before we're willing to admit to God or to God's people, I need help. And today's psalm deals with the reality that there are seasons, there are events in our life that that take our breath away, that, that make life challenging, difficult, um, uh, th- there are moments in which we feel one of the beautif- beautiful things about the Psalms is the Psalms are beautiful poetry in that um, they, they capture raw emotion. The Psalms are not afraid to show us how to pray and to show us how to cry out to God when we lament, when we're confused, when we feel overwhelmed or defeated, when we're angry angry at life or angry with God. The Psalms show us that God is saying, no, no, pour your heart out to me. Tell me what you're going through because I'm here to be your help. And so the Psalm that we're going to see today is, uh, it's honest about the challenges we face, but it also makes a bold celebration. And it's a big idea I want you to see in this Psalm that, that holds the whole Psalm together. 
and it's a familiar line if you if you've uh, uh, you might have heard this line in the church before. It comes from Romans eight. But here's our big idea. I want you to see it. it's in this psalm that if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now these are words that are uh, that, that were preached by Paul when he wrote a letter to the Roman church. And in Romans 8, he has this amazing line that as he's thinking about all the, the challenges that we can face. And he comes to this, this kind of great crescendo of saying, look, if God is for us, what possible thing in all of creation could, could, could stand against us? But before, thousands of years before Paul penned those words, this psalm really captures that theme. It captured it together. It, it, it is a psalm that recognizes that life can be really challenging. But God is our help. The Lord is our help. And so I want to invite you to, to turn to Psalm 124. If you have a Bible, you can grab them in the pews in front of you or on your Bible app. Psalm 124. And, and this is a psalm of thanksgiving. It's a psalm of testimony. It's a psalm of tribute. Uh, this, uh, the, this, these psalms that we're looking at in the summer are these songs of ascent or psalms of ascent. The idea is almost as you look at the, the logo behind us, um, this idea of, of climbing up, climbing up a mountain. And they, they, they literally were climbing up a mountain into, up to Jerusalem, up to the holy city. They were, these were songs that they sung. These were uh, psalms that they recited as they traveled up to the holy city. It was, th th there was actual physical movement of your body up, but there was a spiritual sense that as they recited these things, prayed these things, sung these words, that their hearts would be lifted to heaven, that their hearts would be lifted to the presence of God. And these uh, the purpose of their traveling, um, there were eight different feasts. There were three that they were required to make the travel uh, to Jerusalem for. At least, at least someone from the household had to, had to go. Uh, someone who was leading the household had to go. Three of them. Uh, think about these three feasts. One, the Feast of Passover. In the Passover, what they celebrated was that God delivered them out of Egypt, out of slavery, and, and into the promised land. God is our deliverer. God helped us when we needed help. There's the Feast of Weeks. Uh, the Feast of Weeks was 50 days after kind of the beginning of the harvest or the first fruits that, were, that would come out of the harvest. And they would bring an offering, uh, a, a grain offering, some kind of offering. They'd bring an offering with them and they would, they would offer it to, to God. And one of, there's kind of two pieces to this. On the front end, they would offer this first fruit to God with the belief that God will provide. What's next? So they're surrendering what they have in their hand, trusting that God will provide what they don't have yet. But also they were, they were taught that as their, their fields grew to not, not cut it all down, but to leave the kind of the outskirts open so that those who were less fortunate, those who were poor or, or needy, who were uh, maybe the sojourners or the travelers through, um, the alien, uh, those people who were traveling through, the foreigner, they, they would have something. Um, you, th there was a sense of your compassion and your charity. Again, it's an it's a act of faith. We leave this there for those who are in need. Why? Because God is our provider. God will provide for us. And then there was the, the Feast of Tents uh, or Booths. Uh, it was the idea that they, they remembered their time in the wilderness and how God, God got them through. Water from a rock, manna from the sky. I mean, the, the story is on and on of how God delivered them, God protected them, how the Lord was their help. And so all these things uh, just always was reminding them to be thankful, to, to give testimony that our God, the Lord, is our help. And if God is for us, who can be against us? And so let's read Psalm 124. And it's a short little psalm, a short little song uh, that they sung together. He says, if the Lord had not been our side, on our side, let Israel say, if the Lord had not been on our side when people attacked us, 
They would have swallowed us alive with their, when their anger flared against us. The flood would have, have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. The raging waters uh, would have swept us away. Praise be to the Lord who has not let us be torn by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken. We have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. There's a tremendous book written about these Psalms called A Long Obedience in the Same Directions by a man named Eugene Peterson. And he says about this Psalm, he says, Psalm 124 is a Psalm of hazard and a Psalm of help. So it, it's raw, and then it talks about the challenges that we're going to face. But it's also very powerful in understanding that who will face it with us. Verse one is interesting. I don't know who uh, you saw last in concert, but I want you to try to imagine almost like the, the front uh, singer of a, of a concert. Because it starts off, verse one, it's like, uh, you see this, if the Lord had not been on our side, then he says, let Israel say, it's almost like the lead singer going, everyone now, if the Lord had not been on our side. So he stop, he starts and then he stops and then he kind of comes back to him and he says, no, everyone, if the Lord had not been on our side. And it's, it, it's this whole idea, this kind of lyrical movement and they're singing out together, if the Lord had not been on our side, if God not, had not been for us, uh, we, we wouldn't have made it. Now, why are they singing with such praise? Why do they uh, have such encouragement? Well, we know, uh, I, I want to just draw your attention to two things, kind of two sides of the coin. The first is this, that they were reminded that life's problems were, are real. The Bible reminds us that life's problems are real. And again, the Psalms don't try to hide the emotions we feel when life is tough uh, they, they capture that authenticity of, of, of our pain and our struggle. And you notice there's kind of like an if-then scenario. If the Lord wasn't on our side, then catastrophe. Then, then problems. We would, have, we would have been swallowed up. We would have been uh, captured. We would have been swept away. If the Lord had not been on our side... Uh, there's two categories, it seems, of, of, of their uh, problems. The first is threats. Um, they, the, the psalmist describes the things that are threatening them as a people. Notice the first thing, and, and you can now feel some sense of, of justification about the monster who lived under your bed or in your closet, because the first concern is that thing that would swallow you up, right? It's kind of like this giant monster that will swallow you up, uh, one of the, the, my favorite dives that I was able to do, JP, you have to do this one with me. I want to see your enthusiasm. Uh, but it's down in San Diego uh, off Coronado Islands, and it's a dive that we did uh, with sea lions. And so the boats uh, anchor, and you swim to the islands, and all these sea lion pups just kind of jump out, and they're swimming all around you, and it's not unlike, unlikely to have 15, 20 sea lion pups swirling all around you. This is SeaWorld on steroids. You are in the midst of it all. And at first, it's like a little, it's a little scary because you've got like 1,500 pound tiny little things just kind of swirling in and out, and they're so fast, and they're super curious. And we were doing all these dives, and uh, we got the third dive that we did, we came to the spot where there was a ledge. And so we all kind of like leaned up on the ledge. And then our dive master kind of was sitting, she was kind of laying on the, she, she's amazing, she's kind of hovers. She's just kind of hovering on the ledge about this far off the, the, the ground. And all these pups are diving in and they're, they're nibbling on her, her uh, camera and she has these little bunny ears and they're nibbling on her bunny ears. And at one point, the, the closest I came to being swallowed alive was this moment. I'll show you here. This little baby sea lion coming, sneaking up on me. <laughs> I'm just kind of holding my GoPro like this. And it just kind of comes up, uh, comes kind of walks, uh, uh, swims right up and kind of curious, curious. And, ah, and just kind of gives me this little bite. But when that happened, I don't know what it did, but it triggered something in me. And what it did was it triggered, the, like the, the fact that it kind of bit me, it made me think of where I was, 
So if you can see, you can kind of see in front of me is kind of this ledge that I'm leaning on. But behind me is just this abyss of blue. And all of a sudden, I don't know why I let it come into my mind. But what I let come into my mind was I have no idea what's behind me. It's just this. And I am swimming with shark bait. Like, what am I doing? Why do I have my back to the vast blue ocean while I'm, I'm sitting here with, with all these things that, and I, now, faith is based on reason and I'm trying to have a sense of faith. Wait, they've done this tour hundreds of times. Uh, uh, Christina's done this. She's, and so then I remember her words. Look, Bill, Look, you don't have to be afraid because even if a shark comes from behind you, the first thing it's going to bite onto is your big steel tank. And so I, that thought comes to my mind. So I'm, I'm trying to like move my hands. About, I'm trying to like hover in the water like this. So whatever it, it's going to bite, it's just going to bite metal. Chances are you are not going to be swallowed by a shark tomorrow. Someone please let Pastor Amy know that. If she baptizes you at the beach, chance, you're, you're only going to go in about 18 inches of water. She, she will not go out past that because she's so uh, concerned about what's going to happen. Uh, but it is possible that tomorrow you're going to feel swallowed alive by your boss or your coach or your debt or a conversation you know that's coming that might kill a relationship or your discouragement or your failures or your depression. And, and the Bible does not pretend that those things aren't real and aren't hard. I, I thought one of the best moments at camp uh, Justin's wife, Ryan, Ryan speak, just did this amazing devotion on the first day of camp. And uh, Ryan uh, turned us to Matthew 11, where Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And what she invited the, the students to do was to think about what is making you weary or burdened. As they began to think of it and she began to walk them through possibilities of identity, or fitting in, uh, or falling behind, maybe they're parenting a, a, a child at home, kind of like as, a, as the teenager. I mean, all kinds of things, discouragement, things that are, are, are creating stress and pressure, all the things that are making you weary. And she pulled out this suitcase and she says, okay, it was like an exercise. Okay, I want you to take this suitcase in your mind and I want you to pack all those things in the suitcase. And as we're thinking about those things, we're putting them into the suitcase. And then she did, did this great thing. She goes, okay, now imagine yourself at the beach. Feel the sound under your feet. Is it cold or is it hot? Is it, feel the breeze, smell the salt in the air. It was, it was very sensory uh, driven. And you're kind of thinking about this kind of, uh, and you're, you're walking down the beach with your, with your suitcase full of burdens. And she, she got me um, because I was, I was convinced I knew where we were going. We were walking out to the water's edge and we were just gonna toss the suitcase into the ocean and be gone forever. And then right as you get to the water edge, you turn, she says, and there's Jesus. And he says, give that to me. Let's do this together. And it was just a brilliant way of trying to think about what Jesus says to us. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, my life upon you for I am gentle and humble of heart. Uh, my burden is easy and light. It means it's kind of it's built for you. My, my way is built for you. And it was just a brilliant way to think about it. This, this is how we have to recognize there, that these things, the Bible never pretends that our problems are not real. Whether you're being swallowed alive by something in your life or swept away, the idea of a raging flood is... 
uh, if you've ever seen a flash flood, particularly in a desert area, a very dry area, all of a sudden all this rain comes or somehow water is released and the, and the ground can't absorb it fast enough. And so it just, it just washes away. And you, you might see it and go, well, I could, I could, I could swim through that. And, and it's just pure disaster. And they knew that. They felt this. This was a, a brilliant way to say there are moments in our lives where we don't see it coming and you are swept away by the pain and, the, and, and the, the tension of life. There are real threats. And the point of this part of the psalm, though, is not the hazards, but the help. What, what the psalm keeps doing is it makes real the hazards, but it, it's trying to focus you on if the Lord, though, if the Lord wasn't with us, imagine what would have happened to us. Those things are very real. But, but the celebration is, but the Lord was with us. See, the, the, the classic miscalculation in the Old Testament is not accounting for the Lord. So it's football season, and you're going to hear a number of times, especially in college football, that this is a battle between David and Goliath. Right, it's Appalachian State versus Ohio State. It is uh, certain to be seventy-eight to three. It is going to be the final score, and the underdog is always David, and the powerhouse is Fountain Valley High School. <laughs> it's the Bell Game, but think about this: in that great story. Everyone thinks Israel is the underdog when Goliath runs out into the valley. Everyone but one young person who says, why, why are you afraid? We're not the underdogs. The Lord is on our side. That chump is going to be the one who loses. He knows, he knows before he's even walked in there that he will win. Not because he has any kind of strength in and of himself. He knows that he will be victorious because the Lord is on our side. And in his confidence, it's not his, it's not his skill, it's not Goliath's kind of fading abilities. The, the point of the story is the Lord was on our side there. But then you also see there's a, the idea of a trap. Um, this idea of a fowler's snare. So you have this kind of wood platform. You have these nets on the side. You have this bait in the middle. And it's either triggered by the, the prey coming onto the trap or uh, whoever's hunting is kind of hiding off into the, you know, behind a bush or a tree or whatever. And they wait until it comes and they pull this rope. And it kind of, what happens is it just kind of catches you and kind of pulls you up and it, it, you're trapped. You're trapped. And you're not trapped so that, you know, you can be, it, it's something positive is going to happen. You're going to be destroyed. And there's a part of this that is very real for us in the Christian life. This idea that sometimes we have to recognize that part of our struggle is uh, that we're being, there's a sense of being hunted or a sense of, of an enemy that is trying to work against us. And we're told that uh, in Ephesians 6, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so what are we told to do? Put on the armor of God. You don't have to feel vulnerable to this. You don't have to feel defeated by this. Put on the armor of God because you can stand and God will help you stand. You will make your stand in this moment. Peter writes to the church to, to, to be sober, be alert because your enemy is like a, like a roaring lion. Seeking someone to devour. Uh, you're, you're not given over to it. But you should be aware. And again, all this to say, in verses 1 to 7, there's a sense in there that the battle is real, that the pain is real, that the challenges are real, that the problems are real. But the deliverance comes from the Lord who is our help. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Now, I hope you don't feel overwhelmed. Maybe some of that stuff has come to the surface and you're feeling a little overwhelmed in this moment. But let me show you this, this last thing. It's that the Bible also reminds us that the Lord is your creator and your defender. The Lord is our creator and our defender. He is not only the creator of the world, 
But the psalm helps you see that God is your defender. Verse 8 links all this together with a profound reality that God is the creator of heaven and earth. The whole universe is under his care. And yet, he is the God who knows about the ordinary troubles of ordinary people. He is the God who has the, the power to create and yet he has not gone off into some other place. He is, he is with you. He sees where you are. He has power and sovereignty over everything. But they are singing out because they know that God sees them and knows them and cares about them and defends them. What beast, what storm, what trap could create, could could defeat the creator God? The power in the lyrics is not just that he is the creator. It's that he's our defender. If the Lord was not with us, defending us, I mean, we would we'd have been toast. But the reality in all every part of the song is, but he was with us and he is with us. This is what we have in Jesus. This is what we have now in Jesus. Jesus is described this way to the early church. Colossians 1 says this, that the son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. In him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, powers, rulers, authority. All things have been created through him and for him. I mean, think about it. I just wanted to think about it for a moment. Think about who you are following. The one who all things were made, who not just creates all things, but sustains all things. In Jesus, we see all the fullness of God, all the majesty of God. At the name of Jesus, the darkness trembles. At the word of Jesus, the wind and the waves cease. At the touch of Jesus, the blind see, the lame walk, the leper is cleansed. His name, his name can't be overcome. But he's not just the one who has a power over all things, but he's placed that power at work for us. Verse 19 in Colossians 1 says that God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Whether things on earth or things in heaven. By making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus doesn't just have power. But he's turned his life. He's turned his. All that power. He gave himself on the cross. And for our sake he defeated sin. And he defeated death. And he defeated hell. And he defeated evil. The one you are trusting with your life, both now and forever, is the one who has power over all these things. Every moment you see Jesus walk into a situation where there's some kind of evil in that place. The, it's interesting. The disciples don't always quite get who Jesus is, but, but those spirits do. And they call out. They're, they're terrified. They're, they're asking for mercy. They know his power. And he has conquered all these things. Our Savior is our help, both in this life and in the life to come. I did two funerals this weekend, one on Friday, one on Saturday. And it was just, there's, there's peace to think of our lives hidden in Christ because of what he's done. His death, his resurrection, we, we don't have to do all these things in our own strength. So what do we do with this? I'm going to invite you to do two things today. Here's the first. Um, admit you need help. Admit you need help. This psalm is inviting us to, to recognize we, we need the Lord's help. We need the Lord's help. There's no hiding we need help in this life. And whether it's gnashing teeth or raging floods or a trap, uh, all of this is not just the psalmist's reality, it's our reality as well. So, what are you facing right now? 
What's overwhelming you? What temptation just feels like it's always getting the best of you? Is it physical problem, emotional problem, a conflict, persecution? What, what has you overwhelmed right now? What has you weary and burdened? What would you put in your suitcase today? The posture of a disciple of Jesus is to say, I need your help. The way you become a Christian is you come to to Jesus and you say, I can't save myself, only you can save me. Our life with Jesus begins by admitting we can't do it. I can't do enough good to, to, to earn my salvation, but you have done it for me. It's humbling ourselves before him and receiving his grace. And if that's how we enter into this life, certainly this is how we live in this life. The life of a disciple is to say, Lord, I need your help today. Lord, I need your help through this. And and Jesus is so pleased to say to you, I have committed to be with you until the very end. And the cross says to us, not only that he is with us, but that he is for us. Admit you need help This psalm reminds us that the Lord is present. He is not far off. And the Lord is powerful. There is nothing too big for him. And the Lord is our protector. He is invested in you. That doesn't mean our lives won't be complicated. It doesn't mean our lives won't have trouble or pain. Psalm actually promises that. But it simply says that we can come to Jesus in all these things. But here's the thing is we're going we're to invite you to do as we leave this morning is I want you to get in the practice. Can I invite you to be in the practice of building Ebenezer's? Um, now, Ebenezer, like what's an Ebenezer? Like it sounds like it, it's the first name of Scrooge or it's that thing we're supposed to lift up when we sing come thou found. Here I raise my Ebenezer. It's like I don't know what I'm doing. I hope it's appropriate to do this in church because I'm doing it, but I don't know what it is. An Ebenezer is... It is a memorial stone. And so in the Old Testament, what we see is the people of God, would, there were moments where they would, they would build either a pile of rocks or they would they would place a stone in a place, uh, uh, put it in a place where they could be reminded of God's goodness, how the Lord had helped them. 1 Samuel 7 verse 12 says this, that Samuel took a stone, he set it up between Mitzvah and Shen, he named it Ebenezer, saying Thus far, the Lord has helped us. They'd come through this moment. And God was their help. God had delivered them. God had protected them. And Samuel says, stop. We're going to raise a stone. We're going to remember this moment that that the Lord got us here. And the point of, of the stone is, if the Lord got us here, the Lord can get us there. It is looking back on God's faithfulness with a hope that it produces future faithfulness, future faith in us. We see that we trusted the Lord and he delivered. And so we, in faith, now step out with him. I was trying to, I was telling the students, being up at camp was a little emotional for me because there was a part of me that I thought, man, if I could could go back, like, I didn't get this opportunity When I was 15 at that camp and Jesus is inviting me to follow him, uh, 53-year-old Bill didn't get to come into that moment. Like, I'm from the future. It's all going to be okay. It's going to be awesome. Just trust me. But I I could sit in that moment and go, um, the Lord asked me to trust him, to follow him. And I walked to the front and I knelt down and I gave my life to him. But there I was almost 40 years later thinking, you have been so good to me so good to me I have Kim and Andrew and Trevor and Becca because of you I have Beach Point because of you I I have so much that I can't even express there was a photo of of, uh, you know here's my this this dear friend Dan Speak who was with another church he was in this camp photo of 1985 when I was we were there Kim's in one corner Dan's in one corner I'm in one corner it's like We didn't know that our lives would all converge the way they did. 
and I wish I could say that, but there's a part of me still that I, I've come to this place of realizing I, I need to look at these moments and see God was so good and trust him for what's next. And so here's what I want you to do. I want to invite you as you leave today to grab a rock on the bottom right, 2022. And I want you to do this. I want you to think of a way to praise him for the past. Praise him for the past. Maybe it's the summer. Maybe it's gonna be your baptism. But I want you to write a word or a verse or, or just like, a little description, something in which you saw, you seen God in this last kind of season of your life where you saw God move in your life. Where did the Lord deliver you? Where did the Lord help you? Where did you just experience the grace of God? And what I want you to do with the stone is I want you to, to, to use it to trust him for the future. Um, so put it on a bookshelf or a desk or place it in, an, in your garden or something. You go to my house, you'll see kind of rocks all over our, our house. Um, but they're just, the Ebenezer stone is just simply a reminder. You see, like we have it out there on the Daring Faith wall. All the stones of all of you people, it's our journey together. It's us together saying, remember when we took a risk and God built our faith? And so I'm going to invite us to have a moment here with the Holy Spirit. And so don't be nervous by the silence. Um, the band will play a little bit behind us. But before we lead into this last song, let me just invite you to close your eyes and to pray. That we invite you, Holy Spirit, to make us aware of the ways that you've been moving in our lives, the ways that you've delivered us, the ways that you have helped us. And as you're thinking about that, on the one hand, try to think of the way that God has been your help. What you could write on the stone. But I want you to also be honest with God about the help you need. What is frightening you right now? Where do you need the Lord to make a difference? Admit your fears. Ask for his peace. Pray for strength that you might trust him for help. Listen. What does the Holy Spirit want to bring to mind for you today? Let's take a moment and then we'll close with a final song.